Chapter 36 of Captivating Bible Stories for Young People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Al Olivia. Captivating Bible Stories for Young People by Charlotte Mary Young. 36th Sunday. The Jews at Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Psalm 137, verse 1. When the Jews came to Babylon, some were made to live in the city, where they worked at trades and kept shops. Others lived in the country and worked in the fields. These were not like the fields at home. The goodly land at home was full of hills and valleys, with sloping pastures for the flocks, and vineyards on the sides of the hills. But the land round Babylon was quite flat, with broad rivers flowing slowly and lazily through the meadows, with weeping willows upon their banks. While Jerusalem was being besieged, Ezekiel at Babylon drew the picture of the town on a tile and shut it in with a wall, and lay watching it and weighing out a little bit of bad bread for himself to eat every day, that the other Jews who were with him might know what was going on among their brethren at Jerusalem, as God told him. And in a vision he saw the angels come and mark their foreheads all that were good, that they might not be hurt in the siege, while the bad would die by the sword and hunger and sickness. So it is still. God saves his own good ones. The angels know and mark them when all the rest are given up to God's terrible anger. Second reading. Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 3. The great prophet Ezekiel was shown by God how the Jews should be brought back after all their troubles. The Lord made him have a sort of dream when he saw a whole valley spread over with dry bones. And the Lord said, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, thou knowest. Then the Lord bade Ezekiel sing. And as he sung, there was a shaking, and the bones came together again and joined in their right places. And as he sang on, the flesh came back on them. And then the Lord bade him to call the winds of heaven. And they came and filled them with breath again. And they rose up and lived. Just so, God said, the kingdom of Judah was dead and scattered but he would breathe on it and wake it and join it together again, like the dead bones rising to life. And just so, we know, when all our bodies are dead and our bones lie in the grave, the call of the Lord's voice will waken them up, and we shall rise on our feet, and his breath will come to us, and we shall stand before him an exceeding great army. For that is the resurrection of the body which we look for. Third reading. God gave them knowledge and skill. Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 Among the Jews who were carried away to Babylon there were some little boys young princes of the king's family who had been brought up in the palace of the house of David they could not have been more than 12 years old when they were thus taken from their homes the king of Babylon Nebuchadnezzar thought he should like to have them wait on him so he desired the steward of his place to have them taken into his care to be taught both to wait on the king and to know all the learning of Babylon slaves instead of princes that was sad enough but what grieved these boys most of all was that the dinners that were sent to them all came from the king's own table and they knew that all the meat there came from creatures that had been offered up to idols now there was one boy whose name was daniel who knew that it was very wrong for any jew to eat meats that had been offered to idols some of the boys said they didn't care and some said they were very sorry but they could not help it Yes, Daniel said, they could help it if they would leave off eating meat and drinking wine and only have beans and water. Then three more of the boys said they would stand by Daniel and have only the beans and water rather than break God's holy law. Their proper names were Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. But the king had changed all the boys' names, and he called them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel asked their master, Melzar, to give them none of the rich wine and fine dainties, but only water and pulse, that is, beans. But Melzar said they would grow thin and weak on such poor food, and then the king would be angry with him. Only try us for just ten days, Daniel said. And God so blessed the food that, at the end of ten days, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were fairer and fatter than all their cousins and friends who had been eating the king's dainties. And Melzar had found that none were so true and honest and obedient and painstaking so he trusted them very much, and they grew wise and learned, and still loved and feared their God, 
though they were slaves so far away from home. Now, remember how they began. It was by giving up the things they liked when they found it was wrong to have them. When you are tempted to be greedy, would it not be a good thing to recollect Daniel and the other boys eating beans and drinking water? End of chapter 36. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 37 of Captivating Bible Stories for Young People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Captivating Bible Stories for Young People by Charlotte Mary Young. Chapter 37 Daniel at Babylon. First reading Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17. You remember that the Jews had been so wicked that God had let them be conquered by their enemies and taken quite away from home to the great city of Babylon. The king of Babylon worshipped idols, and he set up a great golden idol, much higher than this room, and commanded that as soon as his music played, everyone should fall down and worship the image, or, if anyone would not, that person should be thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. A furnace is like a very large oven, or like a brick kiln, a sort of house quite full of fire, for burning and baking bricks, or melting iron, or anything else that requires to be made very hot. Many people were afraid of such a horrible punishment as being thrown into the furnace, and when they heard the music, they made haste to bow down before the great golden image. But the Jews knew that they must not worship idols. So what could they do? I only know what three of them did. They were three young men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were brought up before the king because they would not bow down before his great image. The king asked them how it was, and told them fiercely that if they would not worship his golden image, they must be thrown into the fire. But they stood up boldly and said, Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The king was very angry at this brave answer. He had the furnace made seven times hotter than usual, and Shadrach and Meshach and Abnego were thrown into it, tied hand and foot, and the flame was so hot that it burnt the men that threw them in. Presently the king gave a loud cry, for there, in the midst of the fire, were the men, not tied but free and walking in the burning heat as if they were in the cool spring air. And there was another with them, whose form was the Son of God. Then he called them, and the three came out. There was no smell of fire about them, and not a hair of their heads was singed. They had not felt the heat at all, but that the Holy One had taken care of them, and kept them safe in the midst of the fire. Then the king of Babylon knew how wrong he had been, and he sent forth a command that no one should ever speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abnego, who had saved them from the burning, fiery furnace. Second reading. Those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. Great Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a strange dream. He thought he saw a great tree with spreading branches and fine leaves, making a sweet shelter where all the creatures came and stood, and the birds nestled in the boughs. But while he was admiring it, there came a holy one down from heaven, and said that the tree was to be cut down, and only the stump left in the tender grass of the field, and that it should be bound with iron, and wet with the dew of heaven, till seven years had passed over it. When Nebuchadnezzar woke, he was troubled, and was sure the dream had a meaning, and he sent for the prophet Daniel to tell him what it was. Daniel was so sorry that at first he could hardly bear to speak. But at last he told the king that it was himself, Nebuchadnezzar, that the tree meant. He was great and mighty, and countries and people were shadowed over by his power. But soon he would have a fall. He would lose his senses, and his man's heart would be like a beast's heart. And he would be driven out of his palace, and he would eat grass like an ox, and his body would be wet with the dew of heaven and his hair would be long like eagle's feathers, and his nails like eagle's claws, till seven years had passed by, and then he would recover his senses, and know and understand again, 
and he would come back to his kingdom again. Then he would know and own that the Lord of heaven is the true God. Nebuchadnezzar was shocked at first, but soon he forgot all about the dream and felt himself so wise and strong and brave that nothing could hurt him. He was walking one day in his palace, a most beautiful one, and looking out on the grand city with the river running through it and all the bridges and the hundred brazen gates, and his heart was lifted up with pride, and he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have builded? That very moment there came a voice from heaven that said, The time was come. And a strange madness came over the king. His brave, clever spirit became as senseless as a beast's, and he only wanted to graze in the field like the cattle. So they drove him out of the palace and put a band of iron round him and let him eat grass like an ox, and his hair grew long and shaggy and his nails like eagle's claws, just as Daniel had said. So seven years passed away, and at the end of them he came to his senses again. God gave back his man's heart and his reason, and he went back to his palace and sat on his throne again. And one of the first things he did was to have a letter written to his people, telling them all this story, and bidding them do honor to the God of Daniel, who putteth down and setteth up. Third reading. God hath numbered thy kingdom, and finished it. Daniel chapter 5, verse 6. After Nebuchadnezzar, some troublesome times began at Babylon, but at last his grandson Belshazzar was reigning. He was a foolish, self-pleasing young man, and his enemies, the great nation of the Medes and the Persians, came to make war on him. But still he didn't care for anything but his amusement. He thought Babylon so strong that they could never break in, and he gave a great feast to all his lords with fine meats and wines, and he had all the gold and silver bowls and the golden candlestick that had been brought out of the temple of God at Jerusalem on the tables, while he and his friends were drinking and singing and shouting. All on a sudden a stillness came over them, and their eyes opened wide with fright. For just over the candlestick there was seen a man's hand. There was no body, only the hand, and the finger went along writing on the wall, tracing out letters. There were four words, but no one could read them or tell what they meant. The king was terribly frightened. His knees knocked together, and he shook all over, and he called for someone to tell him what this writing could be. Nobody could guess, but at last the queen, his mother, came and put him in mind how Daniel had been able to explain his father's dreams. So Daniel was sent for, and he at once read the writing. He told them Belshazzar was found wanting. His kingdom was going to be taken from him and given to the Medes and Persians. And even then, all the time the Babylonians were feasting and not watching the enemy, Cyrus, the clever king of the Persians, was making his men dig ditches, into which he turned all the water of the great river that ran through the city. And that very night all his army came in, walking up the dry bed of the stream. No one saw them till they were in the city. And that very night Belshazzar was slain. End of chapter 37. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 38 of Captivating Bible Stories for Young People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 38 The Return from Babylon. First reading. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk 2.20 The Jews had gone back to their old city of Jerusalem, but they found it looking very sad and ruinous. The walls were broken down, and the pleasant houses were heaps of ruins, and grass and brambles had come up in the courts, and there were heaps of stone blackened with the fire and smokes that had burnt down the city. The first thing they did was to clear the place where God's holy temple used to stand, and to build it up again. But they were not rich and powerful like King Solomon, who built the first temple. They had no gold and silver, and the new temple they built was very small and poor compared with the old one. There were old men among them who remembered the first temple as it used to be, and they wept aloud as they saw how different the new one was. But there were young men who were very glad to have a temple at all, and they shouted for joy. So there was a mixed sound of weeping for sorrow and of crying out for joy. Then God sent his prophet Haggai to tell the old men not to be afraid, for the glory of this latter house should be greater than that of the former. The way this should be was that our blessed Lord himself would come to the new temple, as a little babe at first and afterwards as a grown man, and when he was there, the honor and the glory of the temple would be greater than ever it was before. 
Now there is no one temple, but God's houses are churches, and we have them everywhere to pray in, and meet him there though we cannot see him. Let us take care to worship him there very humbly and reverently. Second reading. What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Micah 6 eight. The name of the leader of the Jews when they came home from Babylon to their own country was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was their prince. He was of David's family, and he would have been king if the Jews had been allowed to have kings, but he was contented to go back without the crown and throne and scepter that his fathers had had before him, and to live humbly in obedience to the king of Babylon. Zerubbabel's Great Desire That which Zerubbabel cared to have was a little spot of ground among the mountains. It was the village of Bethlehem, the place from which David had been called away long ago from feeding his father's sheep to come and be king of Israel. Why should Zerubbabel care for that little patch of ground more than for Solomon's palace that was so glorious? One reason was that the prophet Micah had said, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings have been from everlasting. And faithful men understood that this meant that the Savior of the world should be born at Bethlehem, and that he would be among Zerubbabel's children's children. That was why Zerubbabel cared so much for the poor little ruined village, and took care to make a home for it again. Though now there were only a hundred and twenty-three people to come back to live in it. God was pleased with Zerubbabel's faith, and blessed him because he had not despised the day of small things. God said that to Zerubbabel a mountain should become a plain, that is, that what seemed most difficult should grow easy, and that Zerubbabel should be the man who should build up the temple again, God's own house that was lying in ruins. That was the great honor this good man had, because he believed in God's promise with all his heart, and went so bravely and steadily to work upon a little, when he could not do a great deal. For him that is faithful in a little shall much be given. Third reading. Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Daniel 6.16 There was another king of Babylon, and his name was Darius. It was the strange, foolish way of his people to treat him as if he were a sort of a god and more than a man, and one day his people came to him and begged him to make a law that for thirty whole days nobody should say their prayers to any god or ask anything of any man except of Darius the king, or if they did, they should be thrown to the lions to be eaten up. Darius thought this was all to do him honor, so he made the law that thus it should be. Now when a law had once been made by the king of that people, it could not be changed. So nobody was to say their prayers to any one but the king for all that time. But by and by the king's people came and told him that there was one old man who did not attend to this law, but that they had watched him in his own room, and there he said his prayers three times a day, just as if the king had made no law at all. The king was very sorry when he heard who it was, for this man who would not leave off saying his prayers was the man he trusted most in all the kingdom. It was Daniel, one of the captive Jews, son or brother to one of the last kings of Jerusalem. He had been taken to Babylon when he was a very little boy, and now he was quite an old man, but he had never ceased praying to the great God of heaven, and he was not going to leave off now. He was a prophet of the Lord, and very wise, and he was one of the king's very best advisers, so Darius was greatly grieved when he was accused. But Daniel could not help himself. The law that had once been made could not be broken, and these spiteful people declared that Daniel must be thrown to the lions. All day long the king tried to get his wise good counselor saved from this dreadful fate, but he could not succeed, and that evening Daniel's enemies came to take him and throw him to the lions in their den. Still, though Darius was a heathen himself, he had one hope, and when he saw his friend led away, he said, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So they took Daniel and put him into a pit among the lions, and they fastened up the door and left him there. And the king was so sorry that he could not sleep all night for grieving for the good, wise, brave man who was thrown to the lions because he would not leave off praying to God, and feared God more than man. And when daylight came, they all went to the den. The enemies hoped to find that Daniel was eaten up, but the king cried out in a lamentable voice, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? And Daniel's own voice came cheerfully back, and told the king that his God had sent his angel, who had shut the lions' mouths, so that they could not hurt him, and had kept him safe all night. And the king was very glad, and commanded them to take Daniel out of the pit, and to put the spiteful men in instead. And the lions were so hungry that they broke all their bones in pieces before ever they came to the bottom of the den. Only think what Daniel was willing to bear rather than not say his prayers, and it was because he prayed that God saved him. 
God's power shut the lion's mouths, because Daniel had been more afraid to leave off praying than even to be torn to pieces. How glad we should be that we can say our prayers safe and unhurt, and how careful we should be never to miss them out of idleness, if Daniel would not miss them out of fear. End of chapter 38「Chapter Thirty Nine of Captivating Bible Stories for Young People. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Captivating Bible Stories for Young People by Charlotte Mary Young. Chapter Thirty Nine, Thirty Ninth Sunday. Troubles of the Jews. First reading. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Proverbs 1, verse 17. There was a gentle Jewish girl named Esther, who had been left an orphan very young, and was brought up by her kind relation Mordecai, who was one of the Jews who had not gone back to Jerusalem, but still lived in Persia. One day there came a messenger from the king to carry away poor Esther from home. The king wanted all the maidens in his land to be brought together, that he might choose the most beautiful of them all for his queen, and the others would be kept for slaves. All the other maidens dressed themselves up and painted themselves to try to look beautiful. But Esther did not ask for any ornaments. She only put on what she was ordered to wear. Yet she looked so much the loveliest of all in her modest quietness that the king chose her and married her and set the crown on her head and made her his queen. But she had a sad life, though she was queen. She was always shut up and could not see her kind friend Mordecai and she could not even go to her husband without his leave, or she would have been put to death. Her kinsman, Mordecai, used to sit in the palace gate every day to hear news of her. Now there was a very bad man named Haman who used to pass by every day, and Mordecai never would bow to him, because he was one of the people whom God had forbidden the Jews to have any concern with. Haman grew so angry at last that he resolved not only to get Mordecai killed, but all the Jews besides. So he went to the king and told him a false story about the Jews, and persuaded him to give orders that their enemies in all the lands around Jerusalem and everywhere else should fall on them on a set day and put them to death. And the king was so foolish and so cruel as to consent to seal the letters, saying that all the Jews were to be killed on one day. But Mordecai heard about this cruel plot, and he sent secret word to Esther that she must try to save her people by telling the king that he had been deceived by Haman. Poor Esther was much afraid. She knew that if she went to the king without leave, she would be put to death, but she thought it was better for her to run the risk than to let all the Jews perish. So she dressed herself beautifully, as the king liked best to see her, and she went to his court, almost fainting with fear. But when he saw her, he touched her with his golden scepter, then she knew he would not put her to death, and when he asked why she had come and what she wanted, she said she wished to ask him to a banquet of wine in her chamber, and when he came there she was able to tell him of the cruel plan for killing all her people, and how falsely Haman had spoken. The king was very angry when he understood it all, and wicked Haman was hung on the very gallows he had meant for Mordecai. And so the Jews were saved by the good queen, who was not afraid to risk her life for her people. Second reading. Thy servants think upon her stones— and it pitieth them to see her in the dust. Psalm 102, verse 14. There was a good Jew named Nehemiah, whom the king of Persia had made his cupbearer. One day one of the Jews came from Jerusalem, and told Nehemiah how sad all was at their home, the city that had once been so beautiful. There was a little bit of the temple built up, but all the streets were heaps of ruins, and only a house or two here and there built up, and the robber tribes around were always breaking in and doing mischief. Nehemiah wept and prayed to God for his people, and when he went in to wait on the king and queen, he still looked so sad that they asked him what was the matter. Then he told them that he had just heard that his dear home, where his father's tombs were, was lying waste, and that the cruel enemies were always doing harm, and he begged the king to let him go home and try to help them. So the king gave him leave, but set him a time to come back, and Nehemiah went all the long way back to Jerusalem. It was quite as bad as he had heard. The houses were all down, only here and there one standing, and when he went out on his ass at night to view the ruins, 
there was a heap of stones where a gate should be and a hole where a wall should be so nehemiah stirred up all the jews and they set to work to build the wall to keep out the robbers then the enemies laughed at them and said a fox could break down all that they had built and when they went on people used to come and attack them so they had to work with swords ready to fight and always on the watch to come to help if they heard a trumpet blown but they kept on and the wall was built and the gates set up and they were safe once more from enemies coming in among them third reading the joy of the lord is your strength proverbs five verse seventeen good nehemiah built up the wall of jerusalem and his friend ezra did all he could to teach the jews to keep the law of god rightly it was ezra who gathered together the five books of moses and collected the writings of the prophets and wrote out the history of the kings and put nearly all the old testament in order as we have it now and ezra and nehemiah took care to teach the people to keep the sabbath again as the fourth commandment had taught them nehemiah used to have the gates of the city shut up that no stranger might bring any burthen in and no one might come in to sell or buy on god's holy day and then they kept the feast of the tabernacles it was a most beautiful feast all the people went and cut down great boughs of myrtle olive pine and citron and willow trees and built up arbors with them where they lived for seven whole days to put them in mind of how their fathers had lived when they came out of egypt and on the great day of the feast every jew went up to the temple with a green bough in his arm and stood in the court and all the priests came out on the steps with palm branches and with silver trumpets then the trumpets were sounded and everybody waved their branches for joy and the priests began a beautiful rejoicing psalm and at its most joyful verses the people waved their palms again at night all the court of the temple was lighted up with great lamps to put the people in mind that the lord is our light how beautiful it must have been and how happy all the people were to have come back from worshipping idols and being punished in a strange land to praise their own true god once more who blessed them and made them happy end of chapter thirty nine recorded by olivia Chapter 48 of Captivating Bible Stories for Young People This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Books Under Banyan Tree Captivating Bible Stories for Young People by Charlotte Mary Young 48th Sunday The Coming of the Lord First Reading the fullness of time was come. Gal, chapter 4, verse 14. Shepherd, there was a long time after the Jews came home, during which we do not know much about them. Only, they had quite left off worshipping idols, and stood out bravely when a bad king wanted to make them do so. But they were not good in other ways. They quarrelled among themselves a great deal. One said, who were called Farsis, were very proud and hard-hearted, and another set, who were called Sadducees, would not believe or obey any of the Bible that was written after the time of Moses, none of the prophets, nor of the Psalms. These two sets quarrelled so much that they allowed a fierce, strange nation to come in and make themselves their master. These were the Romans, whose city was Rome in Italy. They were fierce soldiers and wanted to make the world all their own. One of their generals, whose name was Pompey, was so daring that he forced his way into Holy of Holies, where no one was allowed to go but the high priest once a year. He was disappointed to find nothing there, only an empty chamber without any image or likeness. And the Jews were much grieved and distressed with Pompey afterwards. Second Reading he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Luke chapter 1 verse 32 The Romans set up a strange king over the Jews. His name was Herod, and he was an Edomite, that is, a descendant of Jacob's brother Esau. He believed in the true God and began to make the temple much more beautiful than it had been since it had been built up after the Jews came back from Babylon. But he was a very wicked and cruel man who killed his own wife and made everybody afraid of him, and the Jews were very unhappy under him. 
they had one hope and that was that it was just about the time when god had promised to send a holy one into the world to save them and set them free and they thought he would be a great mighty king like david who would conquer herod and drive away the romans and have a crown and throne brighter than solomon's and just then an angel was sent from god to the little town of nazareth where there lived a young maiden quite a poor woman but most good and holy a descendant of the great king david the angel told her that she was highly favored for she was to be the mother of the son of the highest for the holy one who was to be born of her should be the son of god and when he was born she was to call his name jesus which means the lord our savior because he should save his people from their sins and mary said behold the handmaid of the lord be it unto me according to thy word third reading glory to god in the highest and on earth peace good will towards men luke chapter 2 verse 14 the blessed virgin mary lived at nazareth where it was god's will that the holy son of god should be born at bethlehem the little town where david used to live and keep his sheep the roman sent out orders that everyone should go to their proper home and have their names set down and pay a piece of money so the virgin mary had to go with a good man named joseph a carpenter who was to be her husband such a number of people had come there that there was no room for them in the inn and they had to go to a stable a cavern underground where the oxen and asses were and it was there that the holy child of mary the son of god was born in the stable where the cattle were the blessed mother wrapped him in baby clothes and laid him in the manger among the hay and straw the birth of jesus proclaimed by the shepherds luke chapter 2 verse 17 none of the people in the inn knew or cared but there were shepherds on the hill keeping watch over their flock by night the angels came down to them and told them that to them was born that day in the city of david a savior which is christ the lord and that he was a babe lying in a manger as soon as the angel had said that many other angels who were very glad that poor men below should be saved all began to sing glory to god in the highest and on earth peace good will toward men so the angels and the shepherds kept the savior's birthday and we keep it upon christmas day end of chapter 40th recording by books under penitentiary